Well, good morning again, friends. Uh, I'm curious how everyone's feeling this week. It's kind of a big week for us. I think uh, I feel all sorts of uh, feelings swirling. Uh, there's division happening. Um, and in the midst of that, I just want to take a quick poll right here. I just kind of want to read uh, the temperature of the room, especially in this big week, this week of division. Just real quick, I just want a quick raise of hand, quick poll. Uh, raise your hands if you're voting for the Dodgers. Anyone who is voting for the Dodgers? Anybody? Okay, okay. Dod for the Yankees? Yes? Okay, there we are. Okay, I hear, here's what I see. I see a lot of confused Giants fans because you hate the Dodgers, amen, yes, um, but you also hate the Yankees because if you're not a Yankees fan, you hate the Yankees because... Duh. And um, in the midst of that, you're like, I don't know what to do. And it's just, it's just it's a dividing time right now. It's really hard to know what to do in the, the division and the anxiety of it all right now. But there's some of us that are maybe a little bit more divided, a little bit more anxious about something else going on. So let's take a more realistic poll, a more serious poll. Um, as we look to the election on Tuesday, let me just see where folks are at here. Um, Honestly, show of hands, raise your hand if you're here uh, and you're feeling anxious about the election. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Uh, raise your hand again. Raise your hand if you're feeling excited about the election. <laughs> yeah, we got two folks. Okay, okay. Throw a four. Okay, four, five. Here we go. Raise your hand if you're like, I just want it to be done. Yes? Okay. Good, 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 good. See, there's moments where I'm like, I knew you were my people. I love it. I love it. I love it. Because uh, I'm feeling a lot of the same ways. But this morning, I just want to ask, um, for those of you in this room who are followers of Jesus, how might a follower of Jesus think, feel, and act in this week? How do we take uh, this moment, which obviously has captured our heads, our hearts, and our behaviors, and how might God invite us to do this? And also, um, if you're here and you're not a Jesus follower, what I hope is what you see is a more honest and true representation of how Christians have interacted with government for thousands of years, before there even was a United States of America. And so let me just be honest. We're gonna take a moment, and you may feel anxious for a moment. You may feel confused and overwhelmed for a moment. But by the end, I hope what you see is what I said before of Jesus being the center of our story and how we realize that Jesus is the main character. Amen. You and I are at best supporting characters. And let me say this with all due respect without, um, without spoiling at the end. Some of us, we are telling ourselves a story about the world in which we believe the next president of the United States is a main character, but I just wanted to tell you whoever is our next president, they are lucky to just be written in in the story of what God has done throughout human history. And when you see your place, their place, and more importantly, we're gonna see God's place in all of it, I hope you can take that anxiety, <gasps> place it in front of God, and God will give you confidence, courage and clarity instead. So for the next five minutes, the anxiety may build and the confusion may grow, but give me 25 minutes and at the end you're like, oh, praise God. Or at least I hope you say, praise God. So if you have your Bibles, uh, instead of thinking what Kyle has to say or what pundits have to say, let's see what ha God has to say. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and go to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, we are in a season in which we are studying Romans, and if you've been catching up, you know we're in Romans chapter 8. We started it last week, we'll actually finish Romans chapter 8 next week, but we're skipping ahead because of the election, and because in Romans chapter 13, we have one of the clearest descriptions of what a Christian's relationship with government ought to be. And so in Romans chapter 13, we're going to skip ahead, but also I'm going to move this because I think I feel like I'm about to trip on it. All right, all right, where are we go? I'm going to tap on All right, tech team between services. If I trip on this, you'll be like, all right, that's great. Um, we'll just do that. Okay, here we go. Um, and we're going to ask, what may God say to us and what might be a Christian's res uh, relationship with government? Romans chapter 13, verse 1 through 7, warning it may become more anxious and confusing, but let's read together. Let everyone be subject to governing authorities. To which some are like, huh? Some of you are like, 
That feels anti-American to me. For there is no authority except that which God has established. To which some of you are like, really? The authorities that exist have been established, turning the page, by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but only for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good, which half the room has disagreed with for the last four years. It's good, thank you. It's good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Verse six, this is why you pay taxes. That might, some of you, that's your least least favorite part. (laughs) For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Amen, that's all we need. See you next week. I'm glad you can lean into the humor and also lean into the anxiety of it this morning. So this is what Romans has to say. Some of you are like, couldn't we just stay with chapter eight? That's one of my favorite chapters ever. We'll get back to it next week. But as we ask this question about what might a Christian's relationship with government be, I wanna put this passage in context and not just in the context of Romans and not just in the context of what's going on in that time, but also in the context of what has been the people of God's relationship with government since kind of the beginning of all of this. So let me give you a little timeline. The history of the people of God um, would oversimplify by saying it starts with a guy named Abe. And Abe leaves the family business and he and his wife travel and they leave their homeland and they go and they're actually kind of citizens in other countries with other kings and rulers and other governments and everywhere they go, they've got to figure out how do we interact with government here? And every time they go somewhere, they've got to do things a little different. Great story, Abe makes a bunch of mistakes And if you're feeling here and you're like, oh my gosh, you feel like you're a bad partner or um, a bad spouse, just go and read about Abraham's story and you'll feel so much better about yourself because he's a knucklehead. (laughs) But he has no home, no relationship with government because he's a nomad. And in that world, the government protected their own, not foreigners. And then he has these kids And then they're just kind of this nomadic tribe and they just kind of do their own thing. They're kind of out on their own little island and everything's great. They don't really need a government until there's a famine in the land. And because of that famine, they realize we need help. And so what do they do? They go to the most powerful government of that time. And because of that famine, they go down to Egypt and God says, whoa, 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 don't snuggle up too close to the government. Don't snuggle up too close to Egypt. Yes, you need food, but they go down and they encounter Egypt led by Pharaoh, and Pharaoh becomes the embodiment of evil in this story, of of, of a ruler who uses his power to enslave others to build his own kingdom. And we get a very suspicious, skeptical view of government and leaders, especially those who use their power for their own benefit. And in this moment, they're there for hundreds of years. And if you're a follower of God at that point, you say, God, obviously the government's more powerful than you. The gods of Egypt are more powerful than you. And that's how it seemed for a while. And that's how you feel right now. You seem more captivated by the power of a government than the power of God. You would not be alone. The people of God had that relationship with government while they were in Egypt. 
until God comes and rescues them in this thing we call the Exodus. Think Disney's Prince of Egypt. He sends Moses to come and rescue and deliver. He actually has, God does these 10 miracles that all are a miracle that kind of shows that God is more powerful than each and every single one of these other gods of Egypt. It's the coolest flex ever, if you understand ancient Near Eastern world. It's so cool. And then these people have no government again. They're just going, and they're just following this guy named Moses and following God's presence, and wherever they go, it's awesome. It is the anarchist dream. We have rebelled against authority. We have no king. Woohoo! It's great. And Moses is the governor, if you will, meaning he leads the government, even though there's not really a government here. And as the nation grows in complexity, they realize they need more than just one person. And so he gets advice from his father-in-law that says, you can't be the one making all the decisions and judgment, Moses. You need some other folks, some advisors to delegate to them. And we kind of see this structure of governance happening because as the people of God change, their relationship with government changed, right? Then they go from the Exodus and they go to the promised land right? They've been waiting for this. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's awesome. It's great fertile soil and everything is great until it's not. And when they get into the promised land, they've never had to rule themselves before. And so what happens is there's this cycle in the book of Judges. It is a great book. If you ever want a PG-13 book of the Bible, that is Judges. The story in there are weird and some of them are grotesque, but it's so honest because it talks about the cycle of the people of God. And whether you realize this or not, this is your story and mine. This has nothing to do with government. It just has everything to do with human nature. So give me a little tangent here. In the book of Judges, what happens is the people trust God and then things get so good they trust themselves and they sin and rebel against God and trust themselves more than they trust God because things are good, and then they find themselves under the boot of another foreign power, and God raises, raises up a judge. It's interesting that they're called judges. Um, we think of judges as folks in robes, but really the judges that God rose up, sometimes they would make decisions like that, uh, like a judge or a king, but usually these judges are more like military warriors who are coming to kick some tail. And when the people go back to God, God raises up this savior, usually military, to defeat them, and then they go back. We love and trust God, and the cycle continues. And every time the people of God are in need, God rises up a judge, a leader, to lead them. The people of God, in this, they get tired of it, because what happens is they're tired of just going judge to judge to judge, because what happens is their rivals... Their rival nation, their neighbor nation, the Philistines, are kind of the bullies on the block. And they're kind of going neck and neck, neck and neck. And then all of a sudden, the Philistines have this military breakthrough. They actually find a way to build stronger metals. And so they are impossible to defeat. And so what do the people of God do when they have this military threat that's impossible to defeat? What do they do? Do they go to God? Kind of. They go to God and they say this. They say, God, we want a king. To which God's like, trust me, you don't want a king. No, we really do want a king. We want a big, strong one who's gonna punch the Philistines in the mouth. That's what we want, we want a king. God's like, trust me, I've done a pretty good job as your king. I know you don't see all the things I've done for you, but trust me, having the one true God as your king is good enough. No, no, we really, really want a king. And God goes back and says, okay, here's the deal. If you have a king, here's what's gonna happen. They're gonna tax you. Uh, they're also going to take all of your best livestock. Uh, they are going to get involved with way too many women. And so essentially your daughters will be brought into their house. And the house will have these huge towers that protect and insulate them that were billed with all of your taxes. Are you sure you want a king? And the people of God said, that sounds great. <laughs> right? Why do I need to trust God when I can trust government? Oh yeah, now we're here. Okay, now everyone's in the room. Okay, now we're doing this thing. All right, thank you. We're tracking. Oh, this is fun. Why do we need to trust God when we can trust God, government? And here's what happens. Everything God says about those kings comes true. And it's even better than this. In the history of Israel, they go and they rate every single king. And at the, the story of, of kings, um, at the end of each one's life, it says, king such and such reigned for so many years and either ends this way. It either ends with they did good in the sight of the Lord or they did evil in the sight of the Lord. And here's the good news. For those of you who are part of the people of God, who love God, who trust God and all that, the majority of the kings of God's chosen people 
who have the scriptures, who have God's power and authority, the majority of them do evil in the sight of the Lord. Well, how could that be? Because God knows human nature, and he knows that we rebel and we use our power for our own good instead of for the good of others. And so because of this, whenever they do evil and trust the king or trust themselves or don't use their power to protect the most vulnerable but to protect themselves, what happens is God allows them to be punished. There's three major punishments. We call these the exiles, kind of. Um, Assyria comes in 722 BCE and conquers them. And then in 586, 587, the Babylonians come and destroy Jerusalem and the temple and have this exodus where they take all of the best and the brightest and take them to Babylon. This kind of continues as the Persians rise up, conquer Babylon, Babylon, and now the people of God's relationship with government is even more confusing. But here's the thing you've got to know about this time. In this time that we might call the time of exile, the same thing happened under pagan kings as it did under the kings of the people of God. Some did good and some did evil. And most of them did more evil than good. But here's what you've got to hear, friends. Here's what you have to hear from the story is that God used evil kings to accomplish his purposes. Evil kings to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, to rebuild uh, the temple, and use these evil kings to remind the people of God that they should trust God as their one and only king and not trust a government authority. Let me be clear, the, the nothing I'm saying is trying to be some sort of like coded, barbed language to one political ideology or the other, right? I'm not trying to make any sort of subtle illusions. I'm not that smart. I'm just telling you the story, all right? I'm not making a comment on this election. I'm making a comment on our hearts. We still with me? All right, cool. Here we go, we're cooking. So we see God use good kings and evil kings, and then all of a sudden you get to Rome, and Rome might be one of the most evil of all of them. They have this thing called the Pax Romana. It's called Roman peace. And what happens is they go and they create peace. Why and how? They just kill everyone. And if you disagree with them, they kill you. And then it's all peaceful, right? Because if you disagree, you're dead. Ha! Huh? Great. Right? So I'm like, oh, I'm going to do that in my company. Let me know how it goes for you. Okay. And here is this evil folks who use their power to take advantage of people and actually use their power to be part of a plot to literally kill Jesus. Literally part of a plot to kill Jesus. And here to this, Paul says, all authority has been placed there by God and therefore submit to authority. And we're like, what? This makes no sense. And it makes even less sense in a democracy, right? I mean, back, back then, you're like, you don't get to vote. You just hope you don't get killed. How could this be? First, we have to understand why to submit, what it means to submit, and what it means for your heart as a follower of God. Let's read this again in light of the story and the history of God's people with relationship. 13 verse one, let everyone be subject to governing authorities for there's no authority except that which God has established. Here's the story that Paul's saying is there's one ultimate authority and that's God himself. And what he does is he appoints other authorities and allows both good and evil folks to be under his authority. And because of the order that God has placed it in, that is why you submit to the authority. It's not because the authority is good, but submitting to them is a sign that you believe that there's an authority greater than them. This feels confusing. Let me, let me get practical for a second. I've said this twice from the stage before, and hopefully this will be the last time I say it. When I watched the first presidential debate of this election season, 
I started to freak a little. I'm not saying I had a panic attack, but I was panicking. I was looking at this being like, there's no way this is a good thing. I'm sorry, I just offended your candidate. I'm sorry, that's where I was. I was like, what if this, what if that, all these things. And then I realized I'm feeling overwhelmed and trying to figure out all these things in my head. What does all this look like? And so I did what I should have done first. And what I want you to do first is this. I then go to God and say, God, I'm feeling really anxious about this. God, this does not seem good to me. And he reminded me of these words and he reminded me of my heart and he convicted me of this. And I say this because if you're in the same place, learn from me, learn from God, learn from this. What I realized was I did not believe, in a multiple choice test I believed, but in the core of my being, I did not believe that the God of the universe was more powerful and influential than whoever won the next presidential election. I saw all the things that the next leader of the United States could do wrong and do right, and I saw more wrong than right. And I looked at this and I was overwhelmed, and God said, Kyle, that's because you don't realize that in the end, I am in control. I'd like to say this again, I have two kids, they're both boys, one is eight, one is 11. They don't always get along, shocker, I know. But when my eight-year-old is freaking out because his big brother is being a big brother, he thinks the whole world feels out of control and he does anything he can to get control back. Whether that be run away, hit back, or do anything he can. But the only thing that actually allows him to get actual power back in this relational dynamic is coming to his mom and dad who have actual true authority in the house. He can run away and hide like it never existed, but big brother knows there's no lock on his door. He can try and fight back because you feel good for a second and then you realize he's three years older than you. Or you can go to the one who has the most authority in the house and say, right now, what just happened to me over that remote, over that video game, over whatever that was, was wrong and unjust. But in the end, I don't trust the human that's in control. I trust my heavenly father who's in control. And this is where the beginning of this framework comes from. It's saying that we know that the government is not more powerful than God period. And that's where the beginning of the freedom from anxiety came for me. Did it all go away? No. Because I still believe that who is elected is important. And I do believe that they impact people and people are made in God's image and it matters. But it doesn't matter as much who sits in the White House as the one who sits on the great white throne of heaven. And until our hearts start there, we are living in what I will call an anti-Christian approach. A Christian approach says this, that there are rulers and authority that are good and there are evil, but none of them are more powerful than God himself. So what does this word submit mean, right? This word submit, First feels weird, second it seems anti-American, third like shouldn't we vote and shouldn't we like, isn't like protesting part of it, like isn't that part of it? Well, because even worse, some of us think well in the history the people of God have submitted to governments doing wrong things. Don't you remember the church in Germany submitted to Hitler? Don't, don't you remember that, that, that Christians submitted to governing authorities that perpetuated slave trade and other forms of discrimination? Let's be clear, when he says submit, we're gonna look at what the Greek means in just a second, but before we're gonna do that, we're gonna look at what does he practically say? What does Paul say? Again, a head says God's in control. My hands say this. What does submitting actually look like according to Paul? Verse six. Very specific, very concrete. Let Paul define it for himself. This is why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, taxes, revenue, revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let me be crystal clear about a couple things. First is, this is my opinion, sorry, I gotta be clear, this is Kyle's opinion, not God's opinion, but let me just clarify that. Um, 
as someone whose first job was in financial planning and as a brother who does my taxes, my hope for you is that you pay the least amount of taxes possible without breaking the law. Amen? Okay. If that's not your politics, more power to you. That's my thing. So let me be clear about that. But what does he say? He says, pay taxes. Well, you can't pay taxes to Rome because they're going to use that money to go and do evil. Yep. We can't do it. Can I only give taxes to the part that's going to build the Rome? Because Rome built Rome. Can we just do that? Nope. We can't pick and choose what we do there, why? Because in that, we're thinking that we're the authority. And in a democratic republic, we might be the authority, but here in Rome, you are not. When you are giving money, some of that will go to the war machine, some of that will go to build roads, and you can't control it. But in that, it says, this is what it means to be part of the society, is you pay taxes, you're not in control of everything, and you gotta name that. But then he goes on and says, do what? Give honor and give respect. Let me be clear what it does not say. It does not say, do whatever evil the government commands you to do. Because here's the thing, if that authority is submitted to God's authority, we know that God's authority is the ultimate authority. And so when the government goes against the teachings of scripture, the people of God say, no, because you're not my ultimate authority. When my kids are playing and they want to make rules about how they play their stuffies, that's great. But when the rules are bigger than how you play stuffy, mommy and daddy are the ultimate authority. There is no place in this text or anywhere in scripture where it talks about perpetuating evil just because the government told you to. It does not say Kill when the government tells you to kill. Pay your taxes, give honor where honor is due and respect where respect is due. So let me talk about honor and respect. There are things that our politicians, sorry to say this, I'm not sorry, I shouldn't say things like that. I'm gonna offend you, that's fine on both sides of the aisles that do things that are dishonorable and disrespectful. It does not mean that you honor what they do that's dishonorable, but someone can do something that is dishonorable and you can still honor that human being. Someone can do something that is wrong, but you can still say that they're a human being created in God's image and I will speak up as an American, I will vote, I will protest, I will donate, I will be involved in all those ways. I don't have to support everything they say, but at the end of the day, I do have to respect them because they're a human being created in God's image. And let me be clear, if any of you said about my children what you have said against the other person who's running against your person, if you said those things about my children, I would go postal. I would lose my stuff. So for you to say that's okay about someone who's been created in the image of God says that you don't understand who the ultimate authority is. The ultimate authority is not who you like and who you vote for. The ultimate authority is God himself who created humans in his image and even the one who you think might be ruining the world is still created in God's image and deserves respect. You don't have to like, you don't have to agree but they still deserve respect. So here's what I'm gonna tell you. There are lots of things that are unclear, but let me be clear with you. As your pastor, in this moment, let me be clear. I want you to not only pray for the election, I not only want you to vote in it, I not only want you to do that, but here's the thing. What I want you to do is I want you to commit to praying for whoever the next president of the United States is. And more so than this, if the person who gets elected is the one you did not want, I want you to pray twice as hard. Why? Because they need it? No, because you need it. When you are angry at someone, when you struggle to forgive them, when you have animosity in your heart, especially when you can't have a face-to-face reconciling conversation, I don't know about you, the candidates don't take my phone call, maybe they'll take yours, but when they don't, the best way to go about it is to bring your pain and frustration into the presence of God and say, God, help me pray for them, help me forgive them, help me support them, help me not go crazy every time I see them or think about them, because let me tell you this, they will do things that will be wrong, 
both of them will, but both of them need your prayer and your support. And what I want more than that, even more than they need that, is your heart needs to be free from the vitriol, the anger, and the bitterness that you feel every time you scroll on social, walk by that flag, hear someone say that thing that just drives you nuts. I want your heart to be free from it. And you get it free by wondering, number one, that God is the ultimate authority. And number two, even if I don't like them, I will still love them and pray for them and I will have a God-honoring heart towards that person. I may be right or wrong in how I vote and we can debate what is right or wrong in your voting. That's a great conversation to have. But let me be clear, you know what a right heart is. Even if everyone else around you doesn't. When we step back from social media and cable news and those fights that we have with our families over Thanksgiving, we know in our heart of hearts what is and isn't a right heart towards somebody. I believe in you, I know you know that. So pray for whoever it is and twice as much if you don't want them. That's what it means for you to look and support them. The right head says God's the ultimate authority. The right hands say, I'm gonna be loving and respectful, but I'm also gonna be engaged by voting by paying taxes, by being part of this process. So we come back to this word that's most troubling. Okay, I get that there's an established order. Okay, I get that what's more important, what I can control is my heart towards God, towards the people. Okay, I I get that. But there's this thing that keeps coming back that absolutely drives at least a third of us in this room crazy. And that's this word submit. It's such a hard word. Maybe from your history, from your personality, from the current state, of the, whatever it is, this word becomes so hard for so much of us. So let me talk a little bit about what this means and looks like. And we'll start to wrap up in just a second. This word submit is this Greek word tasso. I'm sorry, no, no, I'm sorry. Sorry, that's not, that's, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. This word appoint that he establishes that he appoints is this Greek word tasso. T-A-S-S-O with a little line over it, tasso. But when it says submit, the word is then hypotasso, which means if God appointed something in its place, you are choosing to appoint yourself under the order of that person. It's you are choosing to put yourself under that order, under that established order that God has created, which seems crazy, but let me be clear. Let me tell you else who else in the scriptures decides to hypotasso and submit themselves to another the one who's the center of our story. Jesus Christ, what does he do? He hypotosses, he submits to the authority of God the Father. But isn't he equal with God? Yes, the Father and the Son are equal. But what does he do? He says, I will choose to submit to the Father. Well, that's God, right? Yeah. Who else does Jesus hypotasso put himself under? Mary and Joseph, his parents. Says very clearly, he submits to them. And everyone knows they were human beings, not perfect. Who else does he hypotasso? Who else does he put himself under? At the end of his life, he not only puts himself under the authority of God the Father, he puts himself under the authority of a corrupt government that runs a sham trial. And even get this, get this, he even puts himself under the authority of death himself. He submits himself to death. Why? Because what Jesus teaches is that when you submit to something, you can transform it. He submits to death so he can conquer death. I can see that one's struggling to sink in. Let's try this again. He submits to a human body so he can transform the human body. He submits to his mom and dad to show us what it looks like to submit to other authorities. He submits to this sham trial because he realized that the words that they pronounce over him are not as important as the words that God the Father pronounces over him. He submits to death because he knows that he is more powerful than death. And some of you says, well, no, doesn't it seem like the government wins? The government's still evil. Even look at this, even 30 years later, the government's still evil. Are we sure that Jesus should have submitted? Let me be clear about this. Jesus never ever held a political office and he completely and totally transformed the entire nation of Rome. 
He never ran for office, he never did anything, but what happened? His life, death, and resurrection had such an impact on other people that their hearts were so transformed that they said, I believe in this so much that I'm willing to die for this. And the government couldn't stop them, why? Because they said, we don't care what the government says, we will die for our faith because Jesus died for us. I believe it that much. And it's not just that I'll die for it, the way I live will be different. I will live with people in different political sects. I will uh, live with people who I disagree with um, politically. I, I will go and love those who everyone else says I shouldn't love. They become this multi-ethnic mosaic who loves folks outside of their tribe. They, they actually love and pay honor uh, to the governor or the Caesar who's evil, but he, they also honor little babies who other folks literally threw out into the garbage dumps and says, we believe that they're made in the image of God so they'd go out and rescue them and bring them and raise them as their own. That is what they did. It was the love of Jesus that transformed the world. So let me be clear. If Jesus submitted, how much more do we need to submit? Not only when they're right, but because for ways that I can't explain in ways that I don't understand, somehow God uses good and evil people to accomplish his purposes. How does that work? No idea. I just know that for the last 2000 years of Christian history and the 2000 years of history we did before that, somehow God conquered and God used good and evil folks. How do you do it? I don't know. But that's where my faith begins and ends. Not in my authority, not in the authority of government, but in the authority of the one who conquered evil, sin, and death on the cross. So in this moment, I want you to take a posture that reflects the authority of God in your life. If you feel comfortable, maybe close your eyes, Sit back straight in your chair. Maybe put your hands, palms open as a way of letting go and receiving what God has for you. And in this moment, just take a breath in and out. Remember that each breath he gives you is a gift. That every day of your life, regardless who is president or governor or mayor, that he causes the sun to rise and to set. As you scan your body and your mind, know that every single one of those thoughts, feelings, desires, anxieties, and hopes he's already aware of. And so he invites you as your palms are open to bring those anxieties, fears, and questions straight to him. Bring your questions, disdain, disappointment. And in this moment, friends, I believe this with my whole heart, the most powerful thing you can do is submit to God the Father who loves you, to Jesus who saved you, and the Holy Spirit who transforms and guides you. It is the most powerful act of submission your life could ever take. And so for some of you, this is the first time in your life recognizing his authority. We celebrate that step with you. Some of you have been walking with Jesus for years and you're realizing there's still places in which you don't believe that he's in control and you are giving those over. Not wrestling is a good thing. And in this posture, I invite us all to hear this prayer. And I pray it becomes your prayer. Gracious and sovereign God, we gather before you today, carrying our own hopes, concerns, and uncertainty. Some of us feel anticipation, eager for the changes we hope to see in the world, while others feel anxious, fearing division or discord. Some approach with frustration or disillusionment, feeling uncertain about the path behead. 
Still others come with a sense of civic duty and desire to contribute faithfully, yet also yearning for peace in the time of disagreements. We carry thoughts of loved ones, communities, and the future of our nation. Amid these emotions, God, we thank you for the freedoms we have in this country, the opportunity to participate and vote and make our voices heard. We remember that we are a part of a world of nations where there are many other nations making choices for their future as well, all seeking paths of peace and justice. Yet above all, God, Father, we rest in your sovereignty. You hold the world and all its nations in your hands. Your wisdom surpasses any human understanding. Teach us to place our trust fully in you, that we may let go of fear and hold fast to your peace. Remind us that your kingdom endures forever, and in that kingdom we find hope. In Jesus' name, all God's people pray. Amen.